Check the mic. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to you all, whether you're watching online, whether you're in the building, whether this is your first time or your 500,000th time. Welcome to Life Church Bath. My name is Joshua, and uh, it's a real honor to be with you guys this morning. We're here to worship Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. We're here to worship Jesus. And so we're going to do that this morning. I want to read to you from the book of Psalms. There's a psalm which just is such an encouragement. If you feel like you're in a place where perhaps the week's knocked you back and forth and Sunday mornings come around and you just don't feel ready to worship and there's something in you that feels maybe a little lethargic or indifferent, I want to read you this psalm. This is a psalm that I go to often just to reposition myself towards worshiping God. So this is Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. And now those who look to him are made radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. When we worship, Something changes. When we worship, transformation happens. When we take our eyes off ourselves and off our situations and look towards Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, everything changes. So let's stand together and let's worship Jesus. excited to worship Jesus with you guys this morning. Just want to encourage you to go for it in your assigned seats. <laughs> um, feel free to dance, feel free to lift your hands, feel free to clap. We want to make a joyful noise onto the Lord this morning. So yeah, let's do that together. <laughs> One moment, please.
you this morning. I just feel like there's maybe many things that you're thinking about, situations, things that you've been praying about, things that you're wanting to see breakthrough, areas that you've been contending for breakthrough. I just really want to encourage you this morning to really declare the goodness of the Lord over those circumstances. As Andy was singing, things, something changes when we declare your goodness. If it's finances, if it's family, if it's health, I want to encourage you this morning to look at God, look at his nature, his character, and declare, agree with what he says about himself, that he is a good God. The psalmist said, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. So this morning, just begin to, even if it's just a whisper, God, I believe you're good. Even in the midst of tears, God, I believe you're good. If you can shout it out in your inside voice, God, I believe you're good. Let's declare the goodness of the Lord this morning. I want to encourage you, don't look at us. Look at the goodness of God. Look at the way he's provided. Look at the way he's saved. Look at the way he's healed. Look at the way he's kept, sustained. Look at his faithfulness. Look at his love. Look at his mercy. Begin to consider the Lord. Consider his ways. And focus on that this morning, on the way that he's spoken to you today, the way that he's kept your family, the way that he's saved your soul. Begin to meditate on the goodness of the Lord and let praise begin to build within you. Let adoration begin to build within you. God, I thank you for the way you've saved us, the way you've invited us into the Trinity. Thank you, Father. I want to encourage you. Keep considering his ways, even at home. God, we thank you. We praise you. Begin to declare. Begin to declare the goodness of the Lord. Because we would have fainted unless we had believed. We would have fainted unless we had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We declare your goodness, God, this morning. Oh, you're always good, God. Taste it and I'll see. You are good, you are good. Taste it and we've seen. You are good, you are good. Taste it and we've seen. You are good, you are good. Taste it. Pressing through past the disappointment, past the disappointment, past the disappointment, or oh, keep on pressing through, yeah, past the disappointment, past the disillusion, gonna keep on pressing through, I'm gonna keep on pressing through. I'm going to keep on pressing through. Yeah, just whisper onto your breath. You're good. You are good. As you do that, I don't know, I feel there's people in this room, whenever you say God is good, there's just a flood of different things that come trying to convince you that he's not. When you say, God, you're good, there's something that comes in. Yeah, but what about that? What about that? Yeah, he lay down there though, didn't he? That didn't come out right. That was embarrassing. That didn't work out. Keep pressing through. Past the disappointment. Past where your expectations might not have been fulfilled. Never changed how good he is. Never changed how good he is. 
He's always been good. This very moment, this very second, he is good. And we can worship him there. So just press on through. Go past the disappointment. Maybe you just need to do something a bit different. It's hard, right? It's quite difficult when we can't sing. We can't sing loudly to really kind of engage with our body. But what's going on in the inside always leaks out to the outside. You don't go to a football match and see a goal and just stand there still and go, yay, that was great. Well done, team. It comes out somehow, in some way, either by clapping or shouting or stamping or lifting our hands. So why don't we just do that as we just keep singing. We just want to stay here. We've got a couple of minutes left, but we want to keep staying here and keep just singing. You are good. You are good. You are good. If you're sat and you're able to stand, just encourage you to stand again. Just with your body say, I'm here. I'm present. I'm not relaxed. I'm on the front foot. Maybe you want to lift your hands as an act of surrender. I'm not going to listen to those little doubts anymore, those discouragements, those things where I'm like, ah, oh, Maybe he's not that good. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm surrendering. I'm saying, God, you're good. You're good. And let's just whisper it in this room. It doesn't matter if it's super loud or quiet. What matters is that it's from the heart. You are good, God. It's where I stand today. You are good, good. Oh, you are good good oh i'm pushing past the disappointment you are good good oh you are good good i believe as i sing it you are good good oh you are good good Just clap the Lord. Clap the Lord. Don't clap the end of the song. Don't clap the end of the song. Clap the Lord. He's good. Clap his praise, his worship, his adoration. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We're here for you. To worship you. To honor you. To give you glory. To give you praise, Jesus. It's all to you, through you, from you, and for you, God. Oh, we love you. We love you for your goodness. We love you for your grace. We love you for your faithfulness, God.
just before we, we come to an end of this song worship, I just feel the Lord wants to minister this morning. We began by singing a song, what's the lyric? Um, I ran out of my grave. We sang a song about leaving the grave and spent the rest of the time singing of God's goodness. And I just, I just believe that the Spirit of God actually wants to minister that journey into people's hearts this morning. You've, you've sung in declaration of God's goodness. But I'm just going to lead us in a very simple prayer. Receiving, receiving the call of Jesus as he spoke into the grave where his friend was buried to come out into the light of the day. So if you, if you want to pray with me, just put your hand on your heart. It's a very simple physical uh, declaration of I'm choosing to posture myself for something to change internally this morning. You can say these words with me. You don't have to say them out loud. They could be under your breath. You say this with me. Holy Spirit, lead me from the grave of my despair. Lead me from the grave of my disappointment. Lead me from the grave of my disillusion and my cynicism. Holy Spirit, lead me into new resurrection life. You are not the God bound by my past. You are the God who is doing a new thing. You are the God who is resurrection and is life. And this morning I receive an encounter of resurrection life. I'll say that one more time. This morning I receive an encounter of resurrection life. Just one more time. Let's just sing your good. Just real simple, real chill. You are good. And maybe you're going to say those words from a slightly different part of your soul, having prayed that prayer. You are good. You are not God bound by my past. You are God doing a new thing, bringing resurrection even here and even now. You are God of the impossible. You are the God who opens graves. You are God who heals the sick. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to be together, isn't it? Thank you, guys. Wonderful band. Give them a round of applause. And the guys at the back serving us this morning. So grateful. You can grab a seat. If you're in the building and if you're at home, I'm sure you're probably dancing around the kitchen, so you can go sit on your sofas. Once again, it's so good to see you all. So good to be with you. Welcome at Life Church Bar. My name is Joshua. If you haven't been here before, uh, whether you're online or in the building and you want to connect with the church, you can simply shoot an email, do it after the service, connect at lifechurchbath.com. If you want to find out more about who we are and what we're doing, our church is made up of families, life groups that get together throughout the week in a myriad of different ways, the heartbeat of the church. So I encourage you, if you want to get involved in the church, to get involved in a life group. Um, and you can find out more about life groups on our website, lifechurchbath.com. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings this morning, which is absolutely an extension of our worship. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And uh, what he was doing there was he was leaning into this Hebrew understanding that everything upon the earth is the Lord's. That God is our provider and our sustainer. And what Jesus was provoking in the people was this new understanding that what is yours isn't what you manage to keep. And what you manage to get and store away and build in your bank account. You're truly free when you're able to give. You're truly free to inherit when you're not someone who has to hold everything, store everything. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
And this morning, as we receive our tithes and offerings, as we give, as we sow into the local church, as we sow into our family, as we sow into the work of the kingdom in our city, we're saying there is enough for everyone. (laughs) And I am not bound by my resources and I'm not bound by my money. Everything is the Lord's. Everything is God's. So let's receive the tithes and offerings. You can do it all through our um, various digital expressions. You can give by text. You can give on the website. You can do it through your bank. We also have a hardship fund, which is an amazing uh, way that we can help people in our family that are struggling, that are going through a difficult time financially. You can find out all about that through our website, lifechurchbath.com. There it is. I'm just going to pray as we do that this morning. Jesus, we thank you that you don't leave us uh, without. You don't leave us in lack. You are the God who sustains and provides. And this morning, we just turn our attention to you, Father, and we recognize it again, that we are not perilous. We're not ships in an ocean, broken, sinking. You are our sustainer and our provider, and you're with us and you're for us. And tonight, this morning, sorry, we rejoice in your generosity. We rejoice in all the ways that you've given to us as we give to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Beautiful. Well, if, uh, if you are here for the first time, there's a ton of different things going on throughout the church where you can get connected into. Do we have the notices? Can we throw that up, the slide, real quick? Beautiful. So tonight we have worship and prayer. This is, this is a rhythm that has come out of last year, really, throughout lockdown. Worship and prayer at 7 p.m., which is happening um, online. And you can just log on and just engage with people in the building up here on the stage just praying and worshiping. It's a beautiful rhythm we have in the church, and I encourage you to get involved. Round the table is happening on Mondays, 7.15 online. If you want to dig a little deeper into the scriptures in a more personal, conversational way than we have on a Sunday, log on to Round the Table, Monday, 7.15. And we've also got some announcements from a couple people in the church. We got one from Tim, I believe, right? Tim's got some real cool things happening with, uh, with the youth. Is that ready to roll, my friends at the back? Yeah, thumbs up. Beautiful. All right, take it away, Tim. Hey, it's good to see you. This is Tim Rudge speaking uh, from Life Church Bath. I am going to give you a powerful, quick uh, update on the A2 Festival. Um, We are really excited as churches across Bath and also uh, Weymouth and uh, Shaftesbury and and many other uh, to put this event on. Um, We feel that uh, young people are crying out to have fun. Um, and um, to encounter Jesus, so we want to create space for that. And uh, we have made some adjustments due to the restrictions uh, continuing to um, be a little bit restrictive this next month, but we have adapted it, um, not cancelled it, so that um, we still are going to go ahead and have an amazing time. So here's the updated version. Please stick with me. I'm going to be as quick as I can, as brief as I can. Uh, but there is some important information to share. It's got, it, it, instead of being three days, it's now going to be one day. One powerful, awesome, fun-packed day. So it's going to be on the 2nd, Monday, the 2nd of August. And it's going to be from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And I'm going to share a little bit of the schedule so you've got a bit of an idea of what's going to happen. But that's at Locks Lane in Shaftesbury, and it's £10. What a bargain. And that £10 covers everything that's happening in the day as well as the dinner in the evening we're going to do a big barbecue there'll be veggie options as well um, so i think that's a very good value for money but you will have to bring your pat lunch so bring a pat lunch um, and arrive at 10 to 11 a.m uh, from 11 to 1 we're just going to uh, create space for lunch and just having fun we've got some inflatables we've got bungee run gladiator jewels and bouncy castles and tons of stuff like that we have live music i want to invite you to to be a part of an open mic if you have a song or a poem or something like that you want to share um there's going to be lots of games and lots of fun stuff to do just to connect with young people across the southwest and then at one we're going to have a session where we're going to gather in a tent um, or, or just outside, depending on the restrictions. And um, we're going to have a, a worship team, a youth worship team uh, from different churches that are going to lead us, as well as a speaker, which is going to be awesome fun. Come to share who the speakers are. Uh, it's going to be amazing. And then uh, from 3 to 7, most of the afternoon, we're, again, just going to open it up to have fun, 
have a barbecue, hang out. There's so much space there um, that we can do sports and all kinds of stuff. And then at seven, we're going to gather again for another session. So we're going to have more worship with uh, A2 a uh, worship team. And then we're going to have another speaker. And we're, we're really believing that God's going to come and really meet a lot of young people. So we want to invite you to come. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So you can find more information about it through the website, which is prayerhouse.uk slash A2 festival. I'll say that again, Prayerhouse dot uk slash a2 festival you can book there and find out tons more information um, but it's going to be a lot of fun hopefully this has answered some questions but if it hasn't if you still have questions then please get in contact with me tim rudge at tim dot rudge at lifechurchbath.com um, and please uh, sign your young people up if you're a young person then sign up yourself um, and uh, we were excited to see you at Lox Lane on the 2nd of August for a day of fun um, and experiencing Jesus. Um, lots of love and speak soon. Brilliant. Amazing. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds amazing. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> and if anybody was thinking, why, why did Tim choose to film it on a VHS camcorder? That's cool now. So it's cool to like shoot something in good quality then make it look like it's shot in bad quality. Um, so to all of you that have been used to shooting on VHSs over the years, we're going back to that now, um, just so you're aware. Uh, and we've got another video. We've got Emma Broom sharing some of what's going on. Take it away, Emma. Summer's nearly here. School's almost out. We know what that means. Time to kick back, have some fun, and relax. 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 I wish I could relax. There's just so much to worry about. Yeah, you know what? I worry sometimes too. But when I do worry, I know that there's someone that really cares about me and that can carry my worries for me. So then I can relax. Oh, wow, that sounds amazing. Please, tell me more. Well, Life Kids, if you want to find out more about this person that can carry your worries for you, come to the forum on the 18th of July, 4 till 5 p.m. Bring your sunnies, bring your hats, wear your favorite summer outfits, because you might just find that church looks a little bit more like a beach than normal. <laughs> Can't wait to see you there. Brilliant. Isn't Emma doing such a good job? I, I, f I am fully anticipating that before long there is going to be a full on pantomime happening in this church through Life, life Church Kids. Who's ready to get into the scriptures this morning? Yeah, a couple people. Good. Well, I have the honor of introducing Mike Smith, who's going to be sharing this morning. Some of you know Mike, some of you don't. Um, it's been a strange year to get to know people. Actually, before we start, I, I just want to do this, something I was thinking about this morning. I grew up for a lot of my church upbringing in Anglican churches, and there was a tradition in the Anglican church which I really loved, and I just want to do this morning in light of the restrictions we've been in for over a year. We would share the peace with one another. Now, no one's getting up out of their seats, no one's hugging, no one's shaking hands, but there's this beautiful tradition of looking over at one another and saying, peace be with you. And just acknowledging that we haven't all spent a lot of time together in the last, well, 18 months. And here we are worshiping Jesus on a Sunday morning. Even if you're home and you want to do it with your husband or your wife or your family members or you want to get someone up on FaceTime if you're watching alone and just do it, please do it. Let's just spend like 30 seconds, look across the aisles, and just all you got to say is, peace be with you. It's good to see you. Can we do that real quick? Beautiful. Wonderful. That is a, um, that's a very special thing to be able to say to one another, peace be with you. Peace be with you. So Mike is, is preaching this morning, and I'm not going to do a long-winded introduction, but I will say this. I know Mike a little bit better than everybody else, because Mike is actually my uncle, which I'm sure you've gathered through the staggering good looks and the undeniable Smith nose. But um, Mike, Mike I'll, I'll say this about Mike. Mike is a stock record, but Mike is stuck 
on the things that I'm really grateful he's stuck on. Mike is a man who absolutely loves Jesus and loves the gospel. And you're likely to find Mike on the streets of tour and picking up litter. You're likely to find Mike talking to people about Jesus, being a great husband, great father, a great grandfather, great uncle. And uh, it's, it's my privilege and honor to welcome him. So Mike, come and bring us the word, uncle. I'm gonna pray for you very quickly. One second, just gonna get a wipe. As I'm getting a wipe, I'm gonna pray. Father, I thank you for Mike. I thank you for what you prepared in his heart. I thank you that he lives the words that he preaches. And I thank you that you are, you are gonna guide him this morning and lead him this morning. I thank you that you love him and that you're for him. And we receive the word that he's carrying. Amen. You hear, but it's quite, well, it's the first time I'm up here, so it's quite um, this darkness in front of me. But I can see some faces, which is which is which is good. I think it's quite good uh, having the VHS cassette. I feel that I feel that I am the VHS cassette as well. <laughs> so of of that era. But um, I'm looking at the clock. So 25 minutes. So I'm gonna, what I normally do when I do speak, I normally put a timer on. So I don't get too bored listening to myself, and nor, nor, neither do you. Um, so I'll do that. Yeah, as Josh said, uh, Mike Smith, I do the helps ministry, and hopefully by the end of this 25 minutes, you'll know something more about me and what we're trying to achieve in the church with, with helps. For those who, are, who take notes or make notes, the title of this uh, talk is Why Did the Christian cross the road. Why did the Christian cross the road? And we'll find out uh, later on. Something which uh, is important to me is the memorization of the Bible. Paul writes in Colossians 3 verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Psalm 1, Joshua 1 verse 9. Throughout it talks about meditating on the Bible. I can't think of a better way of meditating than memorizing. So this morning we'll be looking at the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 30-something. I have memorized it, so you can read along as I um, remember it and see how well I do. So Luke chapter 10. Behold, a lawyer stood up to ask Jesus, to put to test Jesus. And he said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what is, written the what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer replied, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. So the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said, Well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was set upon by a band of robbers. They stripped him, they beat, beat him, they left him half dead. By chance, a priest was traveling from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. When he saw the man, when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite was on the same road. When he came to the place where the man was, he saw him and passed by on the other side. A Samaritan who was traveling came across this man. He saw him and filled with compassion, he went to him. He treated his wounds and poured on oil and wine. He placed him on his animal and took him to an inn where he cared for him. The next day he gave the innkeeper two denarii and said, um, take care of him and when I return, I will pay whatever is owing. Jesus looked at the lawyer and said, of the three men, of the three people, who was the neighbor to the man who was, who was robbed? And the lawyer replied, 
the man who showed mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now, um, I've, been a few, I've been asking quite a few people over the last few weeks and ask, asking people, when you say the good Samaritan, what does that parable mean to you? And the response has always been, I've always said the response is about kindness, being good, and being compassionate. And they're, they're good. That those behaviors honors good, honors God. But is this what the parable is all about? And I would say that I think this parable is perhaps the most misunderstood parable in all of the Gospels. The parables, there's 40 of them, parables, and they're all about salvation. They're all about the kingdom. What was the first, what was the question? Going back to the very beginning, what was the question the lawyer asked? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Just like the young man, rich young ruler, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, tell me what it is. The lawyer replied, about what we know, loving God. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. When the lawyer said about answer, gave, those, gave those loving God, what was he to, what was, and Jesus said, you answered correctly. What was Jesus referring to? What is the requirement to get into heaven, eternal life? Perfection. Perfection. That's what's required. And the lawyer had got it wrong by testing Jesus, showed that he wasn't honoring him. He wasn't treating his neighbor, Jesus, well, because he wanted to test him. So when Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan, what is it all about? What is, who, what was, is the parable of the Good Samaritan about? It's about perfection. That Good Samaritan modeled a perfect neighbor. There's only one person who's obeyed those commandments. And who's that? Jesus. And who's the perfect neighbor? Je okay, because he can't speak, can he? Sorry. I'll tell you, it's Jesus. So, so the, the, per, the, the Samaritan is a good picture of who, who, of who Jesus is. I just, I look, just look at the story. Jesus was, was a Samaritan. Samaritans were hated, Isaiah 52. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Um, he, Je, the Samaritan went to the man. The man didn't come to Jesus. He went to the man. He did everything for him. He met all his needs. He met his physical needs, his material needs, his medical needs, his financial needs, his protection needs, his transport and transportation needs, his shelter needs, and his emotional needs. He did everything for him. He took him to the inn. Which I love this, just using the analogy. The analogy of the inn, you could say, is like the church. Jesus gave the innkeeper this person whom he had saved and then gave him the means, the denarii, to look after him. Then one of the most powerful things he says, he's coming back, and Jesus is coming back. I think the, the Good Samaritan is a, is a picture of Jesus. And the key word in that, that uh, parable is the word compassion. Uh, looking up compassion in the Strong's um, Concordance, compassion is a Greek Hebrew word, I think, which means it's driven in from the bowels. That's where the bowels are broken. Christ has that compassion on the, um, that man, perfect neighbor. So if, if Jesus is the good Samaritan, who are we? We are obviously the man who has broken and been beaten up. And I know there will be many in this room who, can ex who have experienced it, um, are experiences and will experience that being just beaten to a pulp, perhaps physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And Jesus comes to, to us, he comes to me. Who else? Oh, oh uh, yeah. And once else I say, oh, you think about, I'm just glad I'm not the Pharisee. I'm glad I'm not the Levite. And then you think, well, am I? Well, let me tell you a story. With, with this, I've got, uh, in, in this little talk this morning, this is going to be my own personal story. You'll hear of my process of sanctification over the last 40 years. So um, let me just tell you a few stories. The first story, this goes back into the 1980s when I was attached to CID. It was a different time in those days, but part of what we did, we went to see Northampton Town, Northampton play rugby. There's a group of us, and we were drinking beer, watching rugby. Close by to me, a man collapsed. 
I knew things were bad. But what, I wanted to go to this man. I wanted to cross the road to him. But I was more concerned about not looking stupid amongst my mates. And so I stood there drinking beer whilst other people treated him. And sadly, this man died. And I was thinking, and that, you know, God has forgiven me for that. So when I look at the priest and the Levites, I can't condemn them because I've done what they have done. And I'm sure many within this room have not told people about Jesus because of the fear of people around them. Secondly, you start thinking about, well, at least I'm not as bad as the robbers. <laughs> I haven't beaten up anybody. I haven't robbed anybody of, of that. Now, there may be people in this room who have. I don't know the history, but we're forgiven. But I've never actually beaten up and robbed anybody. So I'm okay on this thing. Until I compare myself with Jesus. And he says, if you say anything bad about somebody, you're, you're, you're murdering them. And the people we love most, the person that I love most is my wife. I may have not physically beaten her, but emotionally I have. And using my mouth, I've beaten her so that she's been broken on the other side of the road. I've done nothing. I've, stayed, I've been the Pharisee and the priest, not meeting her needs, wanting her to come to me. So I can't condemn the robbers. I can't condemn the priest. I can't condemn anybody. I see myself there. And what is Jesus? Jesus is the good Samaritan who comes to me. And I, I've been on this walk for 40 years. And I can safely say this, it's been difficult 40 years, but I know that I love Jesus now more than I ever done before. Because I keep reading the Gospels. I keep loving the Gospels. Never, we must never leave the Gospels. We must never leave the Gospels. The Gospel of Jesus dying for me, his love for me, compels me to love others. That's what mercy, this is what helps us all about, knowing Christ's compassions. I'm, I'm moving on now towards the end. I need to come back a bit, sorry. But you can understand my heart. It's that when we, when we look at Jesus on the cross, for me, that means I'm driven to do, other, to, to do other stuff. So we must never leave the Gospels. If you want to do your own memorization, memorize the, the passion of, of, of Jesus before Pontius Pilate and Luke's Gospel. Remember Barabbas? Jesus took Barabbas' place. Barabbas deserved to go onto that cross. Using the analogies, who are we? We're the Barabbas. Jesus took our place. And that the love of Christ, as Paul writes, compels us. So before we know the good news, we need to know the bad news. And the worse the bad news is, the better the good news. And that drives us. So what I want to say this morning is, what is our motivation for good works? And that is the love of Christ. And we're going to move on to what are good works and try and make it practical for us today. So, um, yes, one last thing about being uh, the, um, the Pharisee, the Good Samaritan, it's not about being nice. It's not about being nice, it's about being Christ. So let's move on. Good works... Um, Obviously, James talks about good works. I, I, I haven't really got time to read it, but I'm sure most of you will, will know it. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 10, about good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And in Philippians and in the Old Testament, there's so much about good works. So what are good works? Question, if I barked, if I went woof, woof, does that make me a dog? No, you can't say no. So I'll, I'll say No. If Caroline, my wife, if she went moo, would that make her a cow? Well, the answer is no, obviously. Okay? If I do good works, does that make me a Christian? No. Good works don't make us Christians. Christians do good works because that's what we do. We do good works. Um, so, define good works. Again, I looked up Strong's Concordance and all this. You know, good means good, and works mean works. So, what, what is a good work? What is a good work? I love the Old Testament analogy where you get items from the temple, simply like a cup or a plate, and you consecrate them and make them holy. A good work, in my mind, is anything that we do consecrated to God. Anything we do can make that we could do consecrated to, to God. So let me give, give you another, I'll give you a, um, 
a case study of, of good works. This coming Tuesday, I think Josh mentioned it, I will be in Twerton at 10 o'clock with Colin and we will be gardening. And we will be, we've cleared a garden, done a community garden, and we tell people about Jesus on a few, few occasions. We've changed the environment, changed the culture. In the afternoon, we're litter picking and we're going to do another garden for a woman who, who needs help. Um, that's what I'm doing on Tuesday. Caroline is meeting her daughter and taking our granddaughters swimming. Which one's the good work? I know you can't speak out, but they're both good works, okay? They're both good works. Which one gets all the, which one would get the recognition? Well, obviously, I'm, it's visible. Mine is visible. And what I want to say to people, good works is what you do if you're a Christian. Good works is what you do. And we don't have to beat ourselves up because we're not doing what we see as good works. Good works is what you do. And the danger is for people like me, who are perhaps more visible in my good works, is are those good works about me or are they about Christ? There's another little story. Um, for those who know us, we used to do um, marriage workshops called Lamb, Love After Marriage. And uh, we got involved, the leaders of uh, Lamb asked me and Caroline to do uh, lead Lamb in the United Kingdom. And I thought, yes, we've made it. At long last, we've made it. I'll get my photograph on bits of paper. I'll have, you know, get rounds of applause everywhere and everyone think we are great. Um, I've got a ministry. I can give up work early and get a police pension and really give ourselves to Lamb. The only problem was that Caroline didn't want to. Okay, and I do thoroughly recommend, if you do want to do intermarriage ministry, you are both in agreement with that, okay? So anyway, we were driving, we were driving through Europe, and we were driving through Germany on the autobahns, and, uh, and I was telling Caroline what we could do. Caroline said she didn't want to do it. I got very angry. I actually said, you've married the wrong person. So I'm, I am a driven individual, which didn't go down too well, which meant that through Belgium we didn't speak. By the time we got to Calais, I'd apologized, and we got talking uh, together by the time we got to the Dartford Tunnel. It, it took a long time. The problem being up the front, and do you pray for the church leaders and pray for Emma who, and, and all these people up front, because we're not careful, our good works can be about ourselves and not about Christ. And God is so kind to me because he continually reveals and checks what's going on. Are you doing things for me or are you doing it for Christ? And one of the best ways to make sure we keep doing it for Christ is keep going back to the gospel. Keep going back to Jesus on that cross. That's what good works are. So how does Paul describe good works? Um, that's Colossians 3. Another brilliant verse, first few verses to remember. Colossians 3, those few verses. When Paul says, set your hearts and minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God not unearthly things, because you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. He then moves on to when he says, put to death therefore all that belongs to the earthly nature. And, and, and there's those things. And then he says, put on godly things. He put, one of the things he says is put on a heart of compassion, which takes us back to um, the Good Samaritan. We, we put on Christ, Christ's heart. So he, he, he leads up to all this, and then suddenly in chapter, verse 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's all part of the, that chapter. And then he goes on to what actually good works look like. And he starts off with a family. And he says, wives, submit to your husbands. And we hate the word submission, don't we? This, we hate it. The hackles rise. The way to deal with that is just look at the cross. If Jesus submitted himself to the Father and to us and washes our feet and dies, if we could know this love, submission is not a problem. Then he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, as it says in Ephesians. This is one of the most powerful things ever written. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Die for her. Die for your wife. Husbands, that's your good work. 
I've caused my wife so much pain because of my pride. And I know there'll be wives in this room who feel beaten on the side of the road and their husbands are like priests and Levites waiting for them to come to them and not going. Love your wives. Before you do anything else, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Obey your parents. They know nothing. Obey your parents. If you know what Christ is like, you'll do anything for him. Then his most powerful things in Colossians, slaves, work hard. Honor your, work unto the Lord, not for men. This is your good work, slaves. Slaves probably had no chance of a breakthrough. They were in their job for the rest of their life. It could be a menial job. They could be bullied, could be beaten, could be hated, could be killed because they're somebody else's property. Paul says, do a good job. Do a good, your good work is to, to, um, to obey, your, to obey your, uh, your master. Good works is day to day, week in, week out, just loving and, being, and bringing everything and making everything consecrated to Christ. So, that's what good works are. Everything we do. Um, then moving on to, we've done the motivation for, for like good works. Briefly describe good works. How does this apply for us today? What can we actually do today? And this is where help comes in. Um, I mentioned this to church leaders. I mentioned to leaders across the board when I came from Northampton. Whenever one key thing, I'm now moving to things practical, what we can do, is um, when we start, we've loved our family, then looking to move out from the family, practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. The church is poor, very poor at practicing hospitality. And it's my heart, and I've mentioned it to Jonathan, but I cry out saying, God, please, when we come back in full here, May nobody come to this church lonely and leave lonely. You know, when we first came to the church, we weren't invited out for a meal. Never have been invited out for a meal. So that means that other people coming in here lonely will not be invited out for a meal. So church, please, practice hospitality. It's so easy. On Sundays, what we used to do is just have a bowl of some soup and a pizza and invite people around for, for, a, for a meal. And also, if, if this is too much, do you know what? it doesn't matter. You practice good deeds. It may be just you, you're just struggling to survive with your family. That's fine. I, I don't want to put any pressure on anybody, but just think about what we're doing. And to help you practice hospitality, invite me and Caroline round for a meal. Okay? Practice. Invite us round for a meal. And in Luke 14, Jesus says, when he talks about being a disciple, this is what the cost is, invite those who can't or won't invite you back. So to help you obey that command, invite me and Caroline and we will never invite you back. Okay. Practice hospitality with, with your, with your neighbours. And then with um, just looking at if, if Christ is in us and Christ's heart is for the poor then within us we must see people on the other side of the world, road who are broken. And our good works can be whatever it looks like, but go be walking across the road. And if this was helps could help you walk across the road to deal with the, the things, the barriers that stop us walking across the road, then that's what we're here for. And there's a whole host of things that I know that you want to do and are thinking to do. Come and see me afterwards. I'll, I'll give you my email address at the end. But um, and this is this is basically a bit here about what I'm saying. I'll just quickly check my my notes. But I've covered everything. I hope I, I have covered everything. John 13 verse 34. Jesus says, um, "Love as I have loved you." And if we, and that's why I, I'm sorry for repeating it. Don't ever leave the gospels as a church we need to keep repeating and preaching the gospel every sunday the gospel jesus died for me and as we experience and know that love will die for others and um 
never move the gospel, never move away from Jesus. I think I've nearly finished, but I'm going to finish with a poem. So I wrote this poem and, um, a couple of years, a few years ago. And it's, uh, it's in response to the reading The Good Samaritan. And this is what, this is what I, I wrote. He crossed the road to save me as I lay upon the ground. He loved me and he healed me, oh, and a God of love I found. I was helpless, beaten and lonely, and he met my deepest need. He carried me to shelter, and in my healing I was freed. I do, God is so good. I do get emotional when you get caught up with how good God is and how much he loves me. Because, and that love, you know, we are the Pharisee, we're the scribes, we're the people who don't walk across the road and Jesus loves us. It's incredible. He crossed the road to save me as I lay upon the ground. He loved me and he healed me and a God of love I found. I was helpless, beaten, and lonely. He met my deepest need. He carried me to shelter and in healing I was freed. So in him and his love within me, with him I will cross the road to those who are blind and hurting and remove their heavy load. And pay for what can heal them and meet their greatest need by pointing them to their saviour. So like me in him, they're freed. There is such pain in this city. I know there's such pain in this church. There is such pain in this city. And um, what this city needs is Christ. And for those who believe in Christ, you have Christ in you. Be Christ to your family first, to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your parents, to your work colleagues. Then start moving out. Be Christ to your neighbours. Be Christ. Make cakes for your neighbours. It's so simple. Just be Christ. And if you don't know this Christ who, who died for you, please know him this side of the grave. Get to know Christ this side of the grave. So if there's anyone here who doesn't know this Jesus, please afterwards come and see me or some of the leaders and get to know this Christ. Becoming a Christian is, is perhaps the most difficult thing you will ever do. It's that really hard thing, but it's the best thing you ever do because it's life itself. Now I've, I, I've, I've said that I didn't want a, a song at the end. because I, What I'm hoping is my few words, and I have gone over by one minute, 29 seconds, so please forgive me, is perhaps just spent a few minutes just pondering and thinking about who Christ is and how we can be him to our neighbours and to our friends. Is that okay? And then, um, yeah. So I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray. I'll pray from Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Oh, Lord. Father, I just do thank you for Jesus. And God, please reveal Jesus to our hearts so we can be more like him. So that nothing in this world matters apart from knowing you and loving you and serving you and being you and crossing the road. Father, please, as a church, may we never cross the road, stop not cross the road to those in need. And Father, I just do pray from Philippians 2 that we would do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility we would count others more significant than ourselves. Father, please, let us not only look to our own interests but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among ourselves, which is ours in Christ Jesus, who, who though he's in the form of, God, in form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But may we be like him in making ourselves nothing, taking the form of servant and serving each other. 
And Father, I do thank you that you have exalted Jesus and uh, above all name and, and all authority. And I, Father, thank you that you have enabled us to bow our knees and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So if you do have any questions, comments, thoughts, queries, feedback, um, please email me at helps at lifechurchbath.com. And um, we'll just uh, spend a couple of minutes and then, Josh, is that okay? If we, if we finish, we just... Sometimes when we move into the worship, it, God's may have said something to us and suddenly it just disappears and goes. And hopefully God has done something this morning. And so just ponder for a couple of minutes. Really appreciate that, Mike. Stirring, challenging, encouraging. As we close the service today, just do take what Mike said there practically. If you want to find out more about the Helps Ministry in the church, get in touch with Mike. Um, there's a lot to think about and a lot to go away with. We're going to have some music playing now. You don't need to rush off. Something I do need to ask the stewards. Rosie, you gonna, are you going to come and share about just the safest way that we can leave? So, don't feel like you've got, you got to rush off. We've got a bit of time, but Rosie will tell us how we're going to exit the building. Bless you all. Have an amazing week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.